I think the thing I wanted to speak to you about was seasteading, because, uh, well, it's quite a cool libertarian concept. Uh, I came across it a few years ago, um, and to be honest, I thought it was a bit pie in the sky. So just let me read to you the Wikipedia definition of what seasteading is. So according to Wikipedia, seasteading is the concept of creating permanent dwellings at sea, called seasteads, outside the territory claimed by any government. Most proposed seasteads have been modified cruising vessels. Other proposed structures have included a refitted oil platform, a decommissioned aircraft, blah, 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 you get the idea. Right? So the end goal of the seastead is, is to create a floating city-state or floating nation-state that exists outside of uh, any nation-state's international or any nation-state's waters. So it exists in international waters. Um, and the obvious reasons would be to escape national bureaucracy to create a true sort of freedom. Right. So the the libertarian underpinnings are very clear in the sea state. Um, I think I thought that was a bit of a ridiculous idea because uh, I, I had a number of misgivings like, uh, for instance, what's to stop, once you're in international waters, what's to stop a nation state from taking over? So for instance, let's say you, you form your really cool sea stating community um, and it's successful and it becomes like the next Hong Kong but at sea, it becomes incredibly rich then that's quite a temptation for a nation state to seize. I don't know if they've, if they've addressed that in particular on the seasteading site. I think at the moment they're actually being quite practical about this. So the, uh, there's an Indiegogo campaign to fund seasteading and they're getting a, a Dutch engineering company to actually come up with the concept. They've put it up on the internet. Uh, so definitely check out seasteading.org um, and they've got quite a cool YouTube channel. Um, one of the one of the most active members who seems to make all the videos is a guy called Joe Quirk, a quite an appropriate surname. Um, he's really cool. Uh, he tends to address all of these FAQs. So I'm just looking at the FAQs on the site. Um, a lot of them are, you know, it's, is it realistic? Is it affordable? And I think it's the case of uh, it's a luxurious technology that will gradually become more affordable over time as people invest more into it. Um, however, as Joe Quirk points out, there's been incredible advances in an existing seasteading industry that people don't think of as seasteading usually, and that's the cruise ship industry. So cruise ships in my grandmother's day, uh, that's how she met her husband, she was on a cruise ship on the coast of South Africa, and uh, she was so seasick that she couldn't she couldn't do anything. She just lay on her ground. In fact, one of the crew members, or one of the cabin members, cleaning staff, I don't know what you call the people who walk around the boat, uh, thought that she was dead because she was just lying, absolutely feeling miserable. Uh, cruise ships built nowadays have such good stability mechanisms that you can pour a cocktail right up to the room and you don't have to worry about spillage. You can play putt-putt uh, or miniature golf on the deck and your game won't be ruined, right? So, so seasickness has been taken completely out of it. You've got these cruise ships that are many, many times the size of the Titanic with casinos and malls. And so clearly, like all markets, the technology develops. And it seems to be getting to the point that seasteading is reaching this potential uh, tipping point where uh, it really becomes not just a viable for the rich, but uh, a place where businesses can relocate, where investors can relocate, developers. Um, so I want to cover some of the libertarian underpinnings of seasteading. I'd ask for the technical stuff. I think people can, you know, that's an engineering question, and there seem to be a lot of clever people who think that it's possible. But why? And uh, why is it good? Why does it exist? Why should I care? So, um, I think what led me to seasteading was actually an interest in a similar concept that uh, Paul Romer is pushing called charter cities. So his idea is to go to a nation state, to go to their government, and to say, okay, this piece of land, about the size of a city, coordinate off and um, guarantee in your constitution that is, it, it is legally excluded and autonomous from the rest of the country. Right? So think of something like Hong Kong. Right, where it has its own legal system, a very simplified legal system, 
um, and just leave it alone. Like a nation state must leave it alone. You can set up some sort of autonomous um, mini state that oversees the, the, the basic functions of a state, um, however minimal or big you think they should be. And, um, and the idea is that businesses and trade and so on would flourish in countries that are otherwise quite hostile to business. You know, so at the moment, actually, the charter city movement uh, has secured the Honduras government, which is, I mean, it ranks incredibly poorly in economic freedom. Um, they've managed to secure a piece of land in Honduras where it will be autonomous. Uh, at least they've written this into the constitution, so it remains to be seen whether this happens. And the idea is, in the same way that China benefited from Hong Kong being autonomous, Hong Kong was a developed first world city-state in China, um, while China was still languishing from recovering from the great leaps forward of Mao. Just pulling press stick, because it's important to pull press stick while you're making a YouTube video. In many ways, Hong Kong, it wasn't just something that China could emulate or something that China could trade with, but Hong Kong was actually a gateway into Chinese manufacturing. So, because it was it, it was uh, quite open to trade, open to globalization, uh, it was quite easy for Westerners, for Japanese, and for all sorts of international firms to do business with Hong Kong. And the Hong Kong, being Chinese-speaking and having connections to the mainland, could then go and facilitate the outsourcing of manufacturing from America, Europe, and Japan into mainland China, which was still considered quite scary and hostile to um, outside businessmen. So Hong Kong was kind of a conduit into the free market, or into a freer market. Um, now, the Charter Cities movement is very cool, but I would say the major problem with it is, uh, well, convincing the government, right? Well, what does the government get out of this? There's a lot of ideological interest groups that will make all sorts of um, arguments about imperialism and all sorts of things. Um, so, so I mean, the, the, the Charter City people, poor Omar, he came up with some sort of practical uh, compromises that the Charter City people can make. So instead of taking a piece of land and saying, uh, you know, give us our own nation state in your nation state, which most countries would be pretty hostile to because I think governments, well, you know, the definition of a nation state is extending monopoly over a particular region. So they said, instead of doing that, um, just take, take an embassy, like take the US embassy, uh, and let's, instead of putting it in the middle of your capital city, put it out in the farmlands somewhere, some, some rural area where land prices are low, and give us, you know, give us a few thousand hectares of land just for the American embassy right and as you know according to international treaty agreements and so on UN and all that uh, once you're on the land of an embassy you're officially in that country right so they so they basically so let's carve out a piece of our land a uh, very low value land but let's call this the American embassy immediately American businesses can you know put an airstrip uh, American businessmen can fly and they can conduct business as though they're in the UN so let's so the idea is say so let's carve out a piece of our land, a uh, very low value land, but let's call this the American Embassy. Immediately American businesses can, you know, put an airstrip, uh, American businessmen can fly and they can conduct business as though they're in the US. Uh, they don't have to worry about visas or passports, they don't have to worry about navigating the local laws, the legal system, the uh, languages, the laws and the legal system. Um, and in return they get, uh, they get low cost labor from in the host country. The host country, of course, gets to be right next to America, and as Mexico and Canada will tell you, that's a very lucrative position to be. So that was the Charter City Compromise, and of course convincing people to even just expand the US Embassy is a, is a bit of a nightmare. Right, so the Charter City movement, I think at the moment, has really just, uh, has really just uh, secured Honduras. So let's fast forward to seastead. The cool thing about seasteading is you don't necessarily need a nation state's permission, right? So eventually you can host this thing in international waters. Uh, it becomes a purely market-based question. Can you afford it? Can you get people? It's logistics. It's the type of stuff that entrepreneurs love sorting out, right? And it's a question of capital. It's not a question of barriers to entry and legal opposition and and so on. So, um, as a kind of bridge to charter cities and to seasteading, which I think is quite clever of the seasteading movement, what they're doing to start off with is to create their first floating city within the legal waters of a host country. Right, so, they, they're busy approaching any country that'll take them. 
and they're basically making the following proposition. We set up a floating city right off your coast, and in return, because if you give us uh, legal autonomy and just allow us to do our thing, um, and you don't subject us to your local laws, um, we'll obviously become quite a flourishing or business-attracting floating city, and in return we'll offer all sorts of services and amenities to the mainland. And so obviously there'll be trade, but uh, I think they're making, if I put words into Joe Quirk's mouth, I think they are making certain agreements such as uh, healthcare services and so on that will provide a reduced cost or for free to the mainland. So they become this kind of uh, offshore bubble of free goodies that the that the local state can enjoy without giving up any of its autonomy, uh, to, at least for at least without giving up any of its terrestrial autonomy. Uh, oceanic autonomy is uh, not that not as guarded and uh, not as prized by most states. Um, so that's quite a cool idea because then it immediately allows the charter city thing to happen with minimal disruption to the mainland and perhaps uh, people seeing that there's the successful case of country X with a floating city offshore um, they'll say well why don't we just try this on land it clearly works at sea let's try this on land so I think that's quite nice of the sea steading movement they are promoting the idea of autonomy and of economic freedom through migration which is something that we haven't seen since the world's map has kind of solidified. I mean, even though the borders have shifted dramatically, we've kind of discovered it all, right? Um, yeah, I'm using discovered liberally because I understand America wasn't discovered by European settlers, but you get the point. Uh, it's all been settled, and there's kind of no new land. So the seasteading provides that. One more cool thing I'll say about seasteading is that um, the vote with your house concept. I love this. I, I never really thought about this, but when you're in a nation state, if your government turns bad, uh, the best that you can do is flee. Um, the cost of fleeing is obviously very high. So you see all these Syrian refugees having to give up everything they earn. These are middle class people, a lot of them, giving up everything they earn and just fleeing with like their, a bit of stuff, some clothes and an iPhone to another country, where they then become these refugees, which is a bit of a burden on the, on the host country and so on, right? But seasteading, uh, if you consider it as a floating city, as not just one unit structure, but as, a, as, a, as multiple modular units that link onto each other, if your uh, local government structure becomes a bit hostile, um, you, can un you can detach, uh, this is the theory anyway, you can detach and float away. Right? And if you float away, you literally disintegrate the city, and there's nothing they can really do about it. Especially if there's a mass exodus of houses, that's the city. The city is just a concept, which is a collection of people living together. If the people disperse, they can then go and form their own city-states. Right? So there's an immense amount of a pressure on city-states to compete for uh, their residents. So... Joe Quirk has put forward the idea that not only will sea states provide a kind of liberty um, that is unheard of since the great migration to great migrations to America from Europe, um, he's also said it's going to transform agriculture and aquaculture. They'll be growing all sorts of things out at sea in a very sustainable method, solar power, solar electricity, it'll all be harvested, grown on the spot, um, and it will displace a lot of land-based agriculture. Um, now, I would imagine that animal agriculture would be completely infeasible at sea. And so people would have to begin to develop a, a more, uh, an increased taste for um, vegetables and for plant-based diets. Um, so I want to know, Brett, what do you think about seasteading? And what do you think about the aquaculture scenario? Maybe you can give us some of your uh, insight that you have working in the food industry. Um, and in particular the plant-based food industry. Uh, yeah, just say whatever you want. It'd be nice to hear from you. This is Justin with some sort of cool YouTube sign-off.